The battle between EMD and GE is sort of a Ford versus Chevrolet situation. Two different products from two different manufacturers that yet achieve the same goal. Both have been around for a long, long time, so they both must be good. The Piedmont division on the NS between Atlanta and Washington, D.C. has some of the best track on the railroad. It used to be a mecca for passenger trains before the Hartsfield-Jackson Airport opened near Atlanta. It's double tracked for the most part, and there are many sections that allow for 60 mile per hour running. I'm told that the preference for intermodals are the SD70 ACs, the M-2s, the ES44 ACs, and the ES44 DCs. EMD prime movers generally age better in my opinion and don't wear out as fast. Notice how many SD40-2s are around compared to C30-7s of the same era. The older FDLs were a lot like Alcos. If you didn't maintain them well, they'd go belly up. I heard a rumor and it makes pretty good sense to me. Most GE engines were financed by GE. And when the end of the 15 to 20 year lease came up, GE bought the engines back in for disposition. I guess it helps GE not to have to stock obsolete parts. Most operating and mechanical people seem to dislike GE Prime Movers from what I've been told. I guess the electrical systems were a little bit too robust. I'm no engineer, so I've never run a GE, so I can't say firsthand if they're as poor as some people say they are. A lot of the parts on the EMDs interchange. A good example of this is a GP7 with a 567 crankcase could be refitted with 645 power assemblies. Water pumps are pretty much the same on a GP7 and an SD40-2. GE made good electrical systems. A good example of that is today's Delaware Lackawanna Alco fleet. All use GE electrical components. EMD also used GE electricals in the early days before they made their own. GP30s with Alco trucks usually would pull a little better than those with EMD trucks. The basic problem that I see is that GE crankcases are cast steel and are more prone to cracking and more importantly can't be repaired as easily by welding as can an EMD or even Alco crankcase. The GE crankcases don't last as long as 15 years in really heavy use either such as with Hamersley Iron in Australia. The original Dash 944 CW units supplied in late 1994 have all had new crankcases fitted. However, the BHP Billiton that operates in the same area was using rebuilt former Southern Pacific SD40s built more than 30 years at that time still largely with their original crankcases. This is reflected here in the USA as well. There are very few GE units pre the Dash 7 era remaining and even the early Dash 8s are now disappearing. It is possible that GE will never match EMD in the number of units actually in service. Nothing in the rail fan community triggers debates or strong feelings as to who makes the better locomotive, GE or EMD. The answer isn't always clear cut and dry and a lot depends on what factors are taken into consideration. I'm Railfan AC and you're watching Trains in the 21st Century. In the first battle of this video series, I compared the SD70 Mac and the AC4400 CW. My personal EMD bias notwithstanding, I think that an older EMD such as an SD70, SD75, or even an M-2 is superior to a Dash 8, Dash 9, or even an Evolution locomotive like the ES44 DC. I'm told that they respond faster and dig in better, which is a layman's way of saying that they have faster loading times and better wheel slip control. I've also been told that the wheel slip control on a GE likes to drop the load to almost zero when it detects a slip while keeping the diesel engine revved up. The load usually drops just long enough for the locomotives to roll back against the train, bunching slack up, and then the computer throws it all back on and yanks the slack out, which is an excellent recipe for a broken knuckle or drawbar unless the engineer catches it right away. And while I think that GVOs are certainly superior to the Dash 9s, they still drop their loads in many conditions where an EMD will keep pulling steadily, or so I'm told. Another case for EMD bias is in the land down under. The BHP Billiton system which I mentioned earlier in Western Australia was operated exclusively by about 180 SD70 ACE units. Two units would haul loads of 110 cars each of 308,000 gross pounds around 250 miles to the most distant mine. 
the locals had electronic parking brakes and were running distributed power sets of six locomotives and about 330 cars. Most of the units were a slightly modified design, but 11 were standard units that were built for the BNSF that became available during a peak in iron ore demand. Previously, the line had used Alco C636s and MLW M636 locomotives, GEC 36-7s, and had standardized on GEC 40-8s, and they had about eight AC 6000s as well. Their competitor, the Rio Tinto, went for C44-9Ws, followed by the ES44 DCI units. The ES44 DCI was built on the AC6000 frame with AC6000 radiators as well as the air-to-air -air intercooling in order to operate in the extremely hot temperatures of the summer. They could not have been cheap to buy, certainly a lot more than a bargain basement SD70M-2. The point is that the SD-70Aces were completely standard regarding their cooling systems and operated without any problems in the high desert-like temperatures. The fairly frequent turbocharger failures on the Rio Tinto ES44 DCI units don't help in any way with my bias either. Fortescue Metal started with Dash 9s but picked up a few SD-90 Max. Some rebuilt as SD-90-43 Max and went with SD-70 Aces for all new purchases. So if the SD-70 ACEs are junk, they wouldn't have been selected by very cost-conscious mining companies for critical operations in such very remote areas, much of which is the desert. Just saying. In 2002, GE released the first of a new series of locomotives that would replace their popular Dash 9 series, the ES44DC and ES44AC, commonly called GVOs for General Electric Evolution Series, they were designed to meet the stricter diesel locomotive emission standards imposed by the EPA Tier 2 regulations that took effect in 2005. To meet the new standards, GE developed the 12-cylinder GVO 12 engine. Both the bore and stroke were increased to produce the same 4,400 horsepower as the older 7FDL 16-cylinder engine. The new engine drives an alternator producing AC current that is rectified to DC current. On the ES44DC, this powers the traction motors. On the ES44AC, the DC current is chopped back into AC power to the traction motors. These two models share a common 73-foot, 2-inch frame and the same external appearance. One thing that is different is that the ES44DC and ES44AC external details have changed with almost every year's new orders. Some of the changes dating back to the earlier versions produced in 2005 and 2006 include nose doors on the left hand side, two widely spaced dynamic brake vents, X panels on the electrical cabinet, side grab irons on a long hood and flush mounted top radiator grills and radiator compartment doors. In contrast to EMD's SD70ACE and SD70M-2, which combined existing mechanical and electrical components with a largely new frame and car body, the GE Evolution Series introduced a new 12-cylinder engine, as mentioned before, while retaining the frame, cab, and front hood section of the AC4400 CW. By the end of 2015, thousands of Evolution Series locomotives have been built in three main models, the ES40DC, the ES44DC, the ES44AC and the ES44C4. The ES40DC and ES44DC retain a large cabinet behind the cab on the left side that would otherwise house the inverters on AC units. The ES44C4 was a variation of the ES44AC with the middle traction motor in each truck removed giving an A1A, A1A wheel arrangement. It employed a mechanism above the center axle powered by air cylinders that lifted the axle slightly at low speeds, transferring a small portion of additional weight onto the powered outer axles for greater adhesion. The biggest change in the Evolution Series production occurred with the revised radiators and rear hood section beginning around early 2007. Most other detail changes after that were relatively minor. 
In order to meet those same stricter diesel locomotive emission standards imposed by EPA Tier 2 regulations that took place starting in 2005, EMD modified the SD70 MAC to create the SD70 ACE and the SD70 M-2. Each model is powered by a 16-cylinder, 4,300-horsepower diesel engine. However, on the M-2, the prime mover drives an alternator and produces AC current that is rectified to DC current, which powers the traction motors. On the ACE, the DC current is then chopped back into AC to power the traction motors. The M-2 and ACE were a redesign of the SD70 series, and much of the external design is based on the SD90 series locomotives. Similar features include the full height nose door and rectangular windshields, the large flared radiators with two fans, and the positioning of the dynamic brake equipment at the rear of the long hood. In addition, the inverters were moved from inside the long hood to a box on the walkway behind the fireman's side of the cab. While they shared many mechanical components with the previous SD70M and SD70 Mac models, they received a substantially altered car body and underframe that borrowed from some of the features used in the SD80 Mac and SD90 Mac series. The air reservoirs and associated piping were all moved to the engineer's side while the traction motor cables moved to the conductor's side, as on contemporary GE units. The dynamic brakes were moved from the front to the rear of the hood and a wider radiator section was located behind a lowered and tapered central hood. The underframe was several inches taller than on an earlier SD70 model and resulted in a shorter cab being adopted from the late model SD90 Mac. The radial steering HTCR trucks were carried over and a new, simpler HTSC truck was introduced that lacked radial steering and rode on a shorter wheelbase. Unlike the SD70M and SD70 Mac, which rode on different underframes, the M-2 and the ACE were nearly identical. The main differences were the substantially thicker and more numerous DC traction motor cables, smaller traction motors, and absence of inverter cabinet vents on the SD70 M-2. Visual changes over the production run were numerous but relatively minor, and as the ACE outsold the M-2 by a wide margin, the latter had fewer variations. The dark side of the ACE legacy is that CSX only bought about 20 aces right at the start of their production, and this batch turned out to be real lemons. They ended up being sold back to EMD Progress Rail a few years later, and many were leased to CN and NS in 2018. CSX didn't buy another new EMD until their token order of 10 SD70 ACE T4s a couple of years ago. I heard that these units were initially going to be kept in captive service in Florida's Bone Valley, but they've since been fanned out all over the system. I'm told that the first batch of ACEs that the BNSF got were junk. The second batch came with isolated cabs and nose-mounted headlights. The vibrations in the cab were too much for BNSF standards, so they banned all non-isolated ACEs from lead unit use in 2009 or so. All BNSF headlight ACEs are not isolated, except for one special unit. All nose-mounted ACEs are isolated, except for one special unit as well. UP, NS, and any other roads thought the vibrations and noise wasn't enough to ban them. I'm sure that the crews might differ on that opinion. I'd heard that the Bencef's ACEs were at risk of not leading due to their new trip optimizer requirement, which is a GE exclusive software option. You may have heard it yourself on RailFam videos where they get excited when they see a Bencef ACE leading a train. So, is the debate settled? Probably not. If there are any railroad employees watching, I'd like to know what you think. Do you corroborate what I said in this video, or do you dispute it? You're the real experts, and we'd all like to hear what you have to say. For Trains 21, call me AC.